good morning um, and uh, very glad to be here. This is a new uh, forum uh, for me. We normally attend our own uh, forums within our own discipline, so it's kind of crossing over, And uh, but I'm very excited to be here because this is precisely what we'd like to actually do. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Paul and uh, Udayan for the invite and also Professor Gopinath and uh, Siddhartha Nandi, who, as I understand, uh, were kind enough to suggest that uh, I might have something to say here. Uh, what I'm presenting is uh, joint work with a lot of students. I've been fortunate to have some very good students working for me in the past, and even currently. So what I've listed here are uh, some of the PhD students that I have who've contributed uh, to the talk and also preparing the slides. These are some master students, also very bright. And we've also been very happy to have uh, uh, collaboration with uh, NetApp. Uh, it's worked very well for us. It's gotten us to understand problems of the storage industry better. Uh, Srini, I think, is here. And uh, he gave a, an excellent talk uh, last year. Uh, so I'm going to perhaps just give a, a slightly different perspective and slightly updated uh, uh, perspective on this uh, area. So again, I'm coming from storage from my coding theory perspective, which says that you want to protect data. What's the best way to do it? And we're trying to understand as much of the storage context as possible. Now, uh, somewhat ambitious uh, uh, in the coverage, but basically what I'll talk about is erasure coding, then talk about node failures, different classes of codes that have come. And uh, then uh, at the end, if uh, I'd like to get to one code where I actually show you uh, a code that we've had uh, quite a bit to do with and uh, show how uh, what uh, at first glance might look complicated is not so complicated to, to implement. So I'll uh, go through very quickly through the basics since all of you uh, know all of this. So uh, of course the once you are in the business of storage, the one thing you don't want to have happen is data loss. So you want to make every effort to prevent that and fault uh, tolerance is the key, and a time-honored method of uh, uh, getting fault tolerance is actually uh, simple uh, replication. And uh, for example, in Hadoop, uh, triple replication is common. So what you do is you have a file or a data object, and then you partition it into manageable blocks. And then you replicate the blocks, and then you store them in distributed fashion. So these are supposed to represent nodes in a network or hard disks in a data center or servers. But Triple replication is poor in terms of storage efficiency, so it's just 33%. The way you calculate that is that for one piece of data that you're storing, uh, that you want to store, you are forced to store three just for reliability. So that's 33%. So the question is, are there better ways? And a well-known alternative to use is erasure coding. And uh, these, uh, these erasure coding techniques have been known for long, but only now has the storage industry started paying increasing attention to these, uh, at least in the realm of uh, big data storage. So uh, here, what you actually do is you take a file or a data object, and then you split it into k parts. Now that is dictated by the nature of these codes. So you're not replicating, so you have to make do with only one. It's single replication, so you have to make do with only one copy of the data. The way you get your fault tolerance is that you add additional parity storage units. So you have k storage units, which represent your data. And you add m additional redundant parity storage units for a total of k plus m. Okay? And uh, we will refer to this as a k comma m erasure code. Now, uh, in terms of storage efficiency, for k data units, you are storing k plus m. So the fault tolerance is at most m. And codes that have the maximum possible fault tolerance are called MDS codes. And of that, a prime example are Reed Solomon codes. So this is Reed and Solomon. Reed used to be a faculty member at the same university that I was. So that's a picture I took of him when we were going for lunch. Uh, here's an example MDS code, which has maximum fault tolerance. That's well known to the industry. This is the RAID 6 code with uh, two parity uh, storage units. Now, uh, as I said, there's been increasing attention uh, in using Reed-Solomon codes in, within the industry. So these are some other Reed-Solomon codes that have crept 
into use. Uh, this was actually collected together by someone who gave a talk in January this year. Uh, so the message is that uh, yes, these codes are very relevant. Uh, and even uh, HDFS, uh, the Hadoop distributed file system has uh, said that for long we have been using replication, but we realize that we can't afford to do that anymore given that how much data we have to store. So what they have actually said is they have retrofitted uh, HDFS to be able to accept uh, erasure coding. So uh, they initiated the HDFS EC project, it is tar targeted for release in Hadoop 3.0 and they have a striped uh, layout. So basically the idea in the striping, so you have uh, you know some data, data storage units and some parity storage units that instead of storing data as it comes down here, then down here and so on, you store it horizontally streaming like this. The idea being that no matter how big your file is, uh, you are ready to encode as soon as you have a minimum of 6 megabytes of data as opposed to actually filling this and filling this and uh, encoding the data because I mean you have not protected the data until you have generated the parity. So you do not want to have to wait for all of these to be full before generating parity, you just can do it row by row. So that is the striping approach that they have uh, adopted. One of the things that they say is that they have uh, default code I think is a 6.3 Reed Solomon code, but they make the sentence that, they make the statement that we are interested in incorporating in the future more advanced techniques and that is very encouraging for us. So. Uh, the coding theory on, uh, for its part has evolved uh, in the direction of storage uh, or at least to handle storage and uh, the one uh, thing which was new to coding theory was this issue of node failures. So that is if you are storing uh, data in a distributed manner across uh, nodes in a network then uh, what is going to happen is that uh, you are going to have individual storage units fail and uh, this is from Facebook and uh, over a period of a single month on a day by day basis how many units actually fail. So you can see uh, out of 3000 machines in a single day there were as many as 100 plus uh, failures. So failures are important and how you deal with it is also important. So coding theory has to figure out a way to handle failure. So what what happens with Reed Solomon code? So here is a 10-4 code that is used by Facebook. So 10 uh, data blocks and 4 parity blocks. And so it is very efficient, it is storage efficient, maximum fault tolerance. But supposing you have, let us say that this uh, node fails and you have to actually generate a replacement node, then for this replacement you draw on the contents of these other uh, nodes. And there are two issues here. One is that in the conventional way, the only way people know how to fix this is by downloading all the data from 10 of these nodes, okay. That is enough to recreate the entire file, all the information that is stored here. But then you extract just one from it. So in other words, you are downloading 10 times as much data as you need to recreate a failed node. So that is not efficient. On the other hand, uh, so this point was noted by a UC Berkeley team and they came up with a, an idea. The other point uh, was noted by Microsoft who actually said, wait a minute, there is a problem here in that you are contacting 10 other nodes which means you are disturbing 10 other nodes and that is not good because they could be serving data instead of helping you repair. So these are the two things that were noted. In response what coding theory came up with was they came up with a class of codes known as regenerating codes which are targeted at minimizing the amount of data download which is also called the repair bandwidth needed for node repair. This was from the UC Berkeley team. Then Microsoft came up with the notion of locally recoverable codes where the idea was the number of nodes that you contact, let us try to minimize that. Okay. So uh, this is two new branches of coding theory. Uh, on the other hand, a more recent development is that people said, wait a minute, you are saying all this about the Reed Solomon code, but let me take a quick fresh look at how you repair Reed Solomon codes. And there have been some very interesting developments there. So there have been improvements in how you repair this Reed Solomon code. Uh, in, in fact, 
there was a talk in January addressing this particular code and saying we can go down from so many bits to so many bits using more advanced uh, ideas. So uh, some comments here. One is that uh, these regenerating codes, and we'll focus on a subclass known as minimum storage regenerating codes because they are MDS. So they have the maximum fault tolerance, uh, you know, property. So they're interesting because not only are they MDS like Reed Solomon, but they are more because they can do repair. So we'll focus on this subclass. They are vector codes. So what does that mean? That in our uh, uh, viewpoint, right, uh, we work with what uh, I guess James Planck calls a theoretical stripe. That is, we look at the smallest amount of data that is coded together. So here, we treat these as symbols from a finite field. So there are these finite field libraries which do finite field calculations. So when we write two here, we mean a symbol from a finite field. So that is a scalar, it's one symbol. But the new class of uh, MSR codes are different in that now each, even within a single theoretical stripe, right, what you have in a node is not one symbol, but a collection of symbols. So these are called vector codes. And that changes things completely. And you'll see an example of it. So these are vector codes. And uh, one symbol is replaced by L symbols. This L parameter is called the sub-packetization level. And we'll keep talking about it. This is one of the key points of this talk. Local and recoverable codes are great in terms of reducing the number of people you talk to. However, with uh, locally recoverable codes, uh, what uh, you do have is that you give up a little bit on storage efficiency for uh, that, whereas with MSR codes, you don't. Uh, and there's also been a fresh uh, look, as I pointed out, on how you repair reads, read solomon codes. And the interesting thing is that that fresh approach says that, wait a minute, you're thinking of these as scalars, but I can reinterpret these as vectors. That is, I can pretend, replace a symbol from one field with many symbols from a smaller field, breaking down the granularity, and that will help me repair. So that's where that is, and I won't have time to say anything more about this new thing. Okay, So now moving on to regenerating codes, and as I pointed out earlier, we are going to focus on uh, MSR codes. And uh, so here is a RAID code, and here is a node that's failed, and when you try to repair it, uh, so your the data is A and B, which you store A, B, and then A plus B and A plus, say, 2B. And from any two of these, you can recover the data. So now we are storing these in kind of a mathematical fashion. So these could be symbols in that finite field I was telling you about. But the point is that to recover this, you're going to download two symbols just to recover A. So two units of data just to revive one. So that's wasteful of bandwidth, because this is all going over the network. And on the other hand, regenerating code say, well, that's not really necessary. What they do is they take that symbol, single symbol A and B and replace it by A1, A2, B1, B2. And uh, so in other words, they're replacing everywhere you see a symbol here, they replace them by two half symbols. So that's what you have here. And they show, you can construct this code, it was a handcrafted example, I think, that uh, you can download three half symbols to recover two half symbols. So earlier, two symbols for one full symbol, but now three half symbols for one for two half symbols. So you've come out ahead, uh, even though you've con connected to three nodes instead of two. So this is the point of re uh, uh, regenerating codes. And the key point is that you're breaking up into these uh, half symbols. So this is where that sub-packetization level comes in. So this corresponds to sub-packetization level of two. Now, there's been an evolution of uh, uh, MSR codes, and it's actually that is very much true. So that is that is a drawback of regenerating code. So it uh, depends on which you favor. If you favor a smaller number of nodes to contact, then maybe not. Uh, because uh, regenerating codes are forced to contact at least k. So you cannot cut short on that. But on the, I mean, there's, not, there's no perfect code in that sense. Because if you go with LRCs, which don't have this problem, they sacrifice rate, efficiency, storage efficiency, whereas these don't. So it's kind of a trade-off, yeah. So, so the coding community has paid very close attention to what the industry wants. So first of all, you want an explicit construction, right? You don't want me to say there exists a construction of a code. 
Okay, so there are explicit constructions. Then second thing is you want storage efficiency. So it's easy to construct codes which are not storage efficient, which are optimal. But no, the storage industry wants efficiency. So there was work. Initially it was low, then the people started looking at high. Then the next thing is what about the sub-packetization level? And when I write high and low here, what I mean is high or low with respect to, there are some theoretical bounds. So when I say high, I mean high with respect to those bounds. When I mean low, it's coming close to the bound, so you can't do better. So initially they were all high, but subsequently people have started figuring out how to make that low as well. And uh, part of the thrust of my talk is, so when I say, for example, a code like this is low, what I mean is that it's as low as it can be, more or less. But it's still higher than with the Reed-Solomon code. And the, the part of the point of the talk here is that having a large sub-packetization level is not necessarily a problem. And I hope to show you that a little later. Uh, and uh, the other thing is how many helper nodes you contact. Uh, generally speaking, you contact all the remaining nodes. But uh, so there is interest in the follow-up to that question, how can you make it less than n? But you still can't make it smaller than the number k. So you're doing your best here. Now, in this, there are contributions from different groups around the world. This Sesidharan is a former student of mine. So this is our group. The product matrix was also our group. I had two students who went on to Berkeley. So uh, we had quite a bit to do with this, uh, this particular construction here, which I'll come back to. Uh, so this construction over here, which I call the Yeba construction, so they constructed something in May of 2016. And a couple of months later, we independently discovered what was the same code, although we had a different perspective on it. And I'll present our perspective. And then afterwards, we went on to go further with that same construction. But we came together with the, the US team to actually evaluate uh, this particular code. Uh, NetApp was also part of it. And uh, we evaluated these codes. And I'll show you some performance. Uh, so uh, I will come back to this. And this is giving you a quick overview of uh, the nature of uh, this code. This is just showing you that uh, this is a code. It's an MSR code. And uh, this is showing you the savings in repair time. So let's just focus on this now. So this 2016 means 16 uh, data nodes and four parity nodes. It actually shows you that the repair, actual measured repair time is substantially uh, less than uh, in the case of uh, an RS code. So an RS code, uh, if you compare it, I think it's about uh, a factor of three uh, or more uh, that you save on the repair time. And that's basically because you have to download far less by factor of four to actually carry out repair with these codes. So these codes are uh, that way very good. Uh, and this is the best reported figure of any code that's actually been uh, evaluated in a, or emulated. There are similarly similar savings in network traffic and discrete, but I won't uh, talk about that. Uh, so now, what I'd really like to do is get back to this code and show you how it operates. Uh, but I thought I should give you a kind of a balanced uh, view of some other uh, approaches. So this is uh, the class of locally repairable codes that Microsoft came out. And what Microsoft's point was, they said, OK, take a look at this Reed-Solomon code. So six data, three parity, which means that for repair of one, you have to contact six other nodes. They said that we'll present you an alternative code. It's called the Microsoft Azure code. This has uh, 18 uh, blocks total, 7 plus 7, 14 data, and 4 parity blocks. And they're organized in this particular way. That is, within a larger code, what you actually have are two smaller codes. So uh, it's almost like you have a single parity check code over here, where this parity is simply the parity sum of uh, all these data. So if this node goes down, for instance, they can only work within this local code to actually repair it. Same thing over there. But if two go down here, and now you're worried about fault tolerance, then what you do is you call upon these global parities. So we call these local parities, global parities. You call upon the global parities to help you out. And their point is that, look, the storage overhead, which is the reciprocal of the efficiency, is 18 by 14, which is 1.29 for this code, whereas it's 9 by 6, which is 1.5 for this. And yet, they are comparable because here, I talked to seven, more or less comparable. 
I talk to seven nodes for repair here, but I talk to six. It's more or less the same. But between 1.29 and 1.5, when you translate that into huge uh, quantities of data, that's a big difference. And uh, they uh, claim that it has saved Microsoft millions, uh, and in one place, it was even hundreds of millions of dollars because of that. So that was the uh, new development, and uh, it was appreciated not only in the storage industry, but also in the academic community. They got a Best Paper Award, a uh, very nice one. And our contribution, I'll just mention this in passing, was to actually extend this to hierarchical. So what they were doing is they built a big code, larger code out of smaller codes. But uh, once when I was giving a talk, people said that, you know, it's not scalable. So we learned how to actually design it in such a way, in a hierarchical fashion. That is, you have small codes here, you have middle codes there, and then you have the top code over there. So that if one symbol fails here, you can use the local code. If this local code is overwhelmed by the number of failures, you can tap the middle code. If that also goes down, you can go to this thing. So you can make this any number of levels. So that was one contribution we had. Uh, codes with local regeneration, this is something that I'm really quite uh, proud of that we did, uh, which is, you know, there is regenerating codes and codes with locality both offer different advantages. So a natural question to ask is, can you put the two together? And we did, and we call these codes with local regeneration. And uh, this is an example code. Uh, I, I really will only mention this in passing, but basically the structure is like this. You have a regenerating code here, a regenerating code here, a regenerating code here, all tied together uh, through some uh, parity scheme. And uh, so in other words, what is happening here is that here you had single parity local codes. But here, the local codes are themselves regenerating codes. So you have locality. So now, if this node goes down, it turns out that you can only talk to four nodes to bring this back up in a very simple way. And uh, so they have, and also the bandwidth is very little. You download no more than you store. This is not very efficient in terms of uh, uh, storage efficiency. It's less than uh, 0.5. But on the other hand, every symbol is present twice. So it's what we called inherent double repl replication. And I think that at that time, we were trying to fit this code into the Hadoop as it was, a HDFS as it was existing then. I think it might be worth taking a fresh look given that HDFS is, has also changed and uh, is adapting to the new class of code. So this is some code. But we did this uh, four years ago. This was all, and the evaluation was joined with NetApp. Uh, so I think uh, we'd, we'd like to revisit it at some point. Uh, this, is some, uh, this is what the coding community is doing now. They're saying that, OK, the case of single failure, we've kind of addressed. What about multiple failures? So you should uh, uh, think about this as a data in which these are all your data blocks. You have one set of parity nodes, one for each row, and then another set of parity nodes, one for each column. So you, these are all parity. These uh, 9 are parity, whereas these 16 are data. So if you have these two failures, for example, then what you can do is you can fix it by using the parity here to fix this, using the parity here to fix this. So you can fix two in parallel. But interestingly, you can actually use the same code in a different way. Supposing there are three, now what you can do is you can't use this or you can't use this, but what you can do is you can use this parity here to fix this. Once you fix this, you can use this to fix this. And that. So now, the difference between this case where you could recover from two erasures in parallels at the same time without uh, talking to the same node twice, here you, you have to do it sequentially, but you can handle a larger number of erasures. And sequential recovery is something that we've done a lot of work on, uh, had, uh, again, uh, courtesy of some very good students. I'll uh, just show you uh, the functioning of this code. So this is an example of what we call a couple layer MSR code. And as I told you, uh, this was something that uh, happened more or less about two months apart between uh, what we developed in the Yebarg, who were the first. Uh, and as I said, we teamed up to evaluate these codes. And then subsequently, we've gone further with this class of codes. But here, uh, we're just looking at uh, this construction. and. We are going to look at a 4 to MSR code, which means that there are four data blocks, two parity blocks. 
Now, this looks very scary. I mean, how come if you just have 4 and 2, you have this structure? Well, the way you look at it is that each of this is a data storage unit or a node. So, one node, two nodes, three nodes, four nodes, six nodes. And uh, each node actually stores eight symbols. So, this is your sub packetization level, which is eight. So, each node stores eight symbols. So, the total amount of symbols stored here is 6 into 8, 48. In the example that we'll follow, we'll assume that every point over here uh, in three dimensional space corresponds to two storage of 2 MB. And we'll show you how this actually works. Uh, so, consider a file of size 64 MB. We'll encode using this code. This is called the couple layer MSR code. First step is uh, you break it up into K. Uh, data chunks, so that is 64 divided by 4, 16, 16, 16, 16, okay. Now, this cube has 6 columns, so this is repeating something which I said earlier. Uh, 8 horizontal planes, and each column has 8 points. Each point corresponds to 2 MB, as we have seen, so this is each storage unit. Now, the first 16 MB is stored in the first node over here. The same with the second, it is stored here. The third is stored here, and the fourth is stored here. So that is simple enough. So what I am showing you now is how do you encode data and put it onto this uh, into a storage. Okay. So now we have data for the systematic nodes. So systematic is in coding theory what you would treat as data nodes. So you now have the data nodes, uh, you know, filled up. Now it remains to calculate the contents of the parity node. So, here we follow a somewhat indirect path. Uh, so, there are several steps, but every step is simple. So, what we are going to go from here to here, from a place where the parity nodes are yet to be computed to where they have been actually computed. So, this is our target and we are here and we are going to go through an intermediary which is what we call a virtual data cube. So, in this virtual data cube, uh, we are calling this B. So, how do we get from here to here? So, we will get from here to here and then from here to there. So, we will first start, so we are going, to, our goal is to recreate B first and we will start with this empty uh, unit over here. It turns out that here there is a pairing of elements. So, that is why we call it the coupled layer because these horizontal layers are coupled in a very simple way. There is a coupling between pairs and not all pairs are coupled. There are, so these uh, dots that you see in red they correspond to fixed points. They are not coupled. They are by themselves. All the others are paired. So, for example, this is paired with this. And uh, what you do is to go from here to here, you take a pair over here, you do a simple, very simple coupling transform to go from 2 to 2 and you store it over here. Okay. So, and you repeat this. So, you take this pair, you do this coupling transformation and you store it there. You take this pair, coupling transform, store it there. Okay. And you repeat. And you repeat for all the uh, data nodes. So, and then uh, there are these uncoupled things. For the uncoupled things, no transformation is needed. You can just take them as they are and transfer them. So, you are complete here. Which means that you started with this in this virtual, we call this a data cube. So, this is the data cube we want to construct. We have filled up all this. We need to fill up all this. In the virtual data cube, we have now uh, using this coupling, we fill this up. The next step is to actually compute the parity nodes in the virtual cube, which is nothing but the RS code. So, you just take a simple uh, 4 to RS code, okay, it could be a rate code, and uh, you actually uh, RS encode to get the parity things here. So, from these four, you compute the parity. You repeat this for every one of those, okay. So, in this way, you now have recover the entire virtual data cube. So, now how do you go back and as you might expect here, uh, yeah I should not do that. Okay. So, as you might expect you, you coupled to go from A to B. So, to go back from B to A with respect to these two columns you would decouple and that is exactly what you do. So, from this virtual B you now there is a pairing here. So, you use the inverse coupling and you fill this up. Okay. And this, with this, you are done. So, you have completed the encode. And the point is that even if there was no MSR code and these were just, you were just layering MS uh, Reed-Solomon codes on top of each other, you would still do these encodings. 
So what is different is the coupling. And the experimental results we presented to you earlier were just showing that the coupling transformations are, do not take up too much time and so you don't lose uh, much. Okay? So that is how uh, you actually uh, encode uh, in this. Now, okay, so then the other question is how does this, uh, how does, how do you carry out node repair here? So let's say, so as I pointed out earlier, there are six nodes, so each is a storage unit. And supposing one of them fails, so let's say this is fail, then what we want to do is we want to use the data in the remaining nodes to actually fill this. But we want to do it in a manner different from how Reed Solomon codes do it. What Reed Solomon codes would do it is they would take all the remaining data in four nodes and then uh, transfer that data. But here we are going to use partial transfer and still uh, repair. So first of all, you see here that there are these red dots. So the key point is to repair this failed node, we are only going to draw on data from the other nodes corresponding to planes which have this red dot. Okay. So here are the four planes, horizontal planes, which correspond to these red. And it turns out that the data in these planes is enough to actually repair this. Okay. So there's, there's detail here, but I don't think that's uh, critical. Uh, so I think that's about it. Uh, the point was just to show you that. Uh, so here the subpacketization level is eight, and uh, but uh, it's you need it because the layers have to be coupled. But the coupling is so simple. So our point was that uh, subpacketization may not be an impediment to implementation. So our hope is something like this: that you know they. Uh, HDFS made the adjustment to go from replication to actually an erasure code. And now we are hoping that the, the next step will be taken when you go from so-called scalar erasure codes to these vector erasure codes where you store multiple symbols. And you uh, will inevitably have the subpacketization. Vector codes mean subpacketization. And uh, uh, they will, the architecture will evolve to do this. In fact, one of my students is, uh, uh, is working with Ceph uh, with the Ceph distributed system because Ceph has uh, expressed an interest in uh, Ceph has expressed an interest in uh, uh, allowing uh, repair uh, by drawing what they call sub chunks instead of chunks sub chunks okay so I think uh, so not bad I think I left with a little bit of time to spare so that concludes my talk thank you very much Uh, I mean, certainly you have to do, for example, if you look at the encoding, what is the additional computation you had to do? Layer by layer, the coding, you would have to do regardless of whether it was MSR or Reed Solomon code. So it was only the coupling transformation. So that is true, but we are claiming that it's not, the overhead is not large. What you're getting is a savings in repair bandwidth by a factor of 2.9 as measured. Actual amount of data downloaded is one fourth, but because of some other things, we get a savings of 2.9. So that's a large, I mean, if you translate it. And that, as I pointed out, is the largest known. Because, I mean, there was interest even expressed, for example, with uh, codes known as piggyback codes, right? And uh, very interesting class of codes that uh, it's, uh, they layered the Reed Solomon codes in a certain way and took advantage of the lowering to reduce the repair bandwidth. But what the amount of repair uh, bandwidth savings we are achieving here is much, is quite a bit larger. All right, so I'll thank uh, thank you very much. Uh, just to mention, see, there's a reason why we brought Professor Kumar here. Uh, the reason was that he comes from the academic side and uh, bringing the industry together. So in case you want to look at the areas which he is focusing on and how it can be applicable for your area, so it might be a good time to have a discussion with him after uh, in the break or after some time. So that is one of the purpose also. And we want to look at a lot of enterprising things coming across academic alliances, I mean, between the academy and the industry. So uh, thanks, Professor Kumar, again for coming.